Good morning and welcome to worship on the eighth Sunday after the Pentecost. Today we hear beautiful words of promise from St. Paul to the church in Rome as they struggle through a difficult time. He encourages them to stay strong and remain in God's love, which is eternal. Nothing can separate them from God's love. We also hear parables from Jesus about the kingdom of God, including the parable of the mustard seed, a tiny seed from which comes a mighty tree. These parables remind us in life and in faith to expect the unexpected. And we continue to wrestle with our call to God's justice and mercy in the midst of a world lost under the spell of sin, which manifests itself in many ways, including the sin of racism and hatred against fellow human beings. As a church, we are called to love one another as God has loved us in Christ. To that end, our summer book study at LCI is I'm Still Here, Black Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness by Austin Channing Brown. She is a Christian author who shares her perspective of serving the church as a black woman and how she finds hope and strength to continue her work. I'm hopeful that this can be a congregation-wide discussion as our denomination and our synod have made commitments to be anti-racist. All voices are welcome, and I really mean that. This is a difficult subject, but we really want all to be involved so that the spirit can do something new in our midst as a community. If you haven't read it yet, you can purchase the book at Amazon, download it on your Kindle, or listen to it on streaming services such as Audible. We will send out a Zoom link for the congregation-wide discussion of the book. You can participate either next Sunday, August 2nd at 11 a.m., or Wednesday, August 5th at 7 o'clock p.m. Please contact the office or me if you have questions. Lastly, a memorial service for Joan Morin, our sister in Christ, will be posted to our YouTube channel at 5 o'clock p.m. on Wednesday, July 29th. And you're free to watch it any time after that. And it will be followed by a Zoom reception 24 hours later on Thursday, July 30th at 5 o'clock p.m. Again, the congregation will receive a link inviting them to that Zoom meeting. And there's a memorial service outlined to follow along with that service that was emailed out to the congregation. If you would like a copy mailed to you, please email John Morin at morin at dcn.org. We wish the Morin family well at this difficult time. Contact the office if you have any questions. And now we continue with our gathering hymn. Thank you. 
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Beloved and sovereign God, through the death and resurrection of your Son, you bring us into your kingdom of justice and mercy. By your Spirit, give us your wisdom that we may treasure the life that comes from Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. Today's reading is from Romans 8. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good, for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be confirmed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for, for us all, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died. Yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ. Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of God, the word of life. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 13th chapter. Jesus put before the crowds Another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast, that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant 
in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind when it was full. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The Gospel of our Lord. Good morning. So there's this television show called The Price is Right. Have you seen it? It's been on television for more than 50 years. And I know when I was little and I was sick and stayed home from school, it's something I watched every single time. So the contestants, they're shown an item and they have to try to guess how much this item costs. The one who guesses closest to the actual price without going over wins a prize. I thought it would be fun to play the prices right today. So I brought this package of Pop-Tarts. Yum, right? Pop-Tarts. My kids get to have them one time a week. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna see who can come close to guessing the price, the closest, without going over. You ready? If you think the price of this package of Pop-Tarts is more than $4, raise your hand. Okay, so if you raise your hand, you're out of the game because $4 is more than the cost of the Pop-Tarts. If you think the price of the package of Pop-Tarts is less than $2, raise your hand. Okay, if you raise your hand, you're out of the game too because they cost a little bit more than $2. If you think the price of these Pop-Tarts is more than $3, raise your hand. Okay, if you raise your hand, you're probably still in the game because we're close. Okay, next I'm going to call out prices and intervals. And raise your hand if you think that the Pop-Tarts cost that much. $3.19, raise your hand. Okay, you're out of the game. Next price, $3.29, go ahead and raise your hand. All right, you two are out of the game. $3.39. You're out too. How about $3.49? Congratulations. Everybody who raised their hands for $3.49, you're the winner. Now, I'm sure, I'm sure that you'll share this with your friends though, right? So in today's gospel reading, we learned about a couple parables that Jesus, Jesus read. And the first one says, Once there was a man who found a treasure, which someone had hidden in a field. He was so happy that he immediately went and sold everything he had and bought this field so the treasure would be all his. The second parable or story Jesus told was of another man who went in search of fine pearls. Now, if you're not sure what a pearl is, it's the little tiny white bead. Sometimes they have multiples on necklaces. And when he found this pearl, he thought it was the very best. So he sold everything he had so that he, they, he could buy this pearl. Now, both those men thought they had found something that was worth giving everything they owned up for. But Jesus wasn't talking about a treasure he wasn't talking about pearls. He was actually talking about heaven. Heaven is more precious than silver, gold, or jewels. 
This is why Jesus calls us to give up everything we have and follow him. Because ultimately, that will lead up to heaven. So what do you think of the price about that? Do you think heaven is worth giving everything up for? That's a call that you have to make. But if you ask me, I would say the price is right. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all of our possessions. But nothing we have can compare to the life in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Dear friends, grace to you and peace from God, our creator, and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. An enduring image in my mind from my 2017 sabbatical will always be a throng of Palestinians at a gate between Bethlehem and Jerusalem, asking, pleading impatiently to be let across into Israel. I don't know why they needed to get across. Maybe they had family to visit. Maybe they had a job to get to. Perhaps they wanted to go to one of the holy sites in East Jerusalem to go and pray. Muslims went there regularly on buses to pray every day. I just know there were Israeli soldiers with very large guns and military fatigues guarding the gate and preventing them from crossing over. There were dozens of them too, not just a couple, two or three. Clearly the soldiers saw these people as a threat to security. I just saw frustrated people trying to get somewhere. I was with my friend, Jody, a Presbyterian minister in North Carolina. As we came up to this throng of humanity, I thought, oh dear, this could take a while. What happened, however, really shocked me. The soldiers signaled to us to hold up our U.S. passports, which we did. And at that point, the throng of Palestinians waiting to cross over parted like the Red Sea, just split into two so we could walk straight through the middle and cross through the gate to the other side. There were men, women, and children of all ages. We were pleased to have it so easy. We had trudged all the way up the hill in hot summer weather to see the birthplace of Jesus in Bethlehem, which was a long walk from Tantur, where we lived for that month. So we wanted to get home as soon as possible. But as we crossed through the gate, I took one look back. I actually snapped a picture of those people who remained on the other side. And something inside of me just did not feel right about what had happened. I mean, I was relieved to have an American passport and felt quite grateful at the access it gives you <laughs> overseas. You can go a lot of places that others can't in a time and manner that others would never be able to. But I, had a, I still had a distinct sense of being privileged, even though I'm not exactly rich or famous. Blessed, you might say, with the fortune of being born in the right country. But thinking about those who remained on the other side troubled me. Who were they? Where did they want to go and why couldn't they get there? They lived there. They were Bethlehemites. I was just a tourist. Now the story of Israel and Palestine is a long and complicated one and frankly deserves a class to understand more thoroughly. But suffice it to say, there are two peoples living in the same land who tell themselves entirely different stories both about themselves and those other people. And they have an altogether different experience in that same place. And one clearly has more power over the other. Does this sound familiar? The privilege white Americans enjoy over people of color is much like the privilege Jody and I had of waltzing through that crowd of Palestinians on their home turf not entirely like it, but not entirely unlike it either. For those of us who have the fortune of being born with white skin, people move out of our way 
and we let them. We have to acknowledge at least that this happens and once in a while look back and notice the faces and the humanity of those who are left behind looking at us. But things might just be changing. In the midst of a global pandemic, we have come to a new reckoning about race in America. After the death of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and so many other black and brown people whose lives were taken unjustly or inappropriately, many Americans are looking at our entire history and wondering what America actually is. Are we the land of the free and the home of the brave? Or are we, in fact, something else? If we're honest and we embrace the Christian doctrine of sin, we have to confess that we have got it wrong at least as often as we have got it right. America may be a shining light on a hill, but its residents are flawed individuals equally in need of God's grace. If you truly believe in this country, which is perfectly reasonable to do, then you have to believe in its values, including the self-criticism that the framers built into our founding documents, such as the Constitution. For while they dreamed about a new land built on liberty, opportunity, and the rule of law, they also knew that they practiced it imperfectly. Some of us are wondering, so what now? I know as a white man, I feel like much of what I have been taught is simply inaccurate. <laughs> it's at least slanted from the perspective of white privilege. That is to say, the perspective of those who are able to make others move to the side so they can plow through and have their way. I feel like in so many ways, I need to be reprogrammed to hear voices and experiences from precisely those people who are ignored or forgotten, those people it is so easy to overlook. I don't blame anyone for this. I'm not pointing fingers at my teachers or the schools. I think they did the best they could under the circumstances they were handed. But we've kind of reached a new era and approached a new insight about who we are and what it means to be the United States of America. For one, this country is not just for white people. I'm pretty sure about that. <laughs> so any law, attitude, or policy that promotes America as a white-only nation is unjust and stands under God's judgment. Jesus, recall, sent the disciples out into all nations, pantata ethne, to baptize, to preach, and to teach. No distinctions, no boundaries, no skin colors, didn't matter. And I believe symbols of white privilege, power, and supremacy are falling for a reason. Now, that is not the same thing as saying there is no place in this country for people of European ancestry, such as me, or that somehow they should be canceled. And it certainly doesn't mean any kind of nonsense like white genocide. Such notions are ridiculous and need to be named as such. But it does mean that a lot of the assumptions white Americans have made about this country are, at a minimum, incomplete, because they have overlooked, ignored, or pushed to the side far too many whose ideas, insights, and hard work have been critical to making us truly great. Simply seeing that, recognizing it, is a huge part of building a new America. It's one of the reasons we are reading together as a congregation, a wonderful book by a Christian author, Austin Channing Brown. I'm still here, as I mentioned earlier, Black Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness. I thought it was a fantastic read. I practically read it in one setting. She tells her story of being in the church, working for parachurch organizations. And she helps those of us who happen to be white to understand her perspective her experiences, her frustrations. It's both challenging and disarming at the same time. She shares her perspective as a black woman with honesty and grace. I'm curious to hear what your perspectives might be as we struggle with the call to be an anti-racist church and an anti-racist congregation. I don't know what the answers are if I'm being honest. But I believe we, the people, can figure them out together, both as a nation and as a church. St. Paul tells us that 
when we don't know what to do, the Spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. The text from Romans is a beautiful word of encouragement to a community in distress. The Christians in Rome were not being treated well. It's hard to imagine, but they were in the minority back then, the group that was ridiculed, ostracized, and in some cases outright persecuted or killed. He tells that church to trust that even when things are going terribly, God can still work through them to bring about redemption, healing, and wholeness, and that nothing can separate them from God's love. As perhaps my favorite passage in the whole Bible says, for we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. That means that God can work through any circumstance to bring about something positive. Therein lies our hope. However, hope can be elusive, especially for black Americans who time and time again have had their hearts broken as they looked forward to one promise after another broken, each opportunity to build a new America dashed, every chance for white privilege to be slaughtered and lain on the altar of the Lord passed up. We want to hold on to our proverbial passports and claim the right to plow through the crowd. Each time, old wounds ripped open to fester and bleed as Ms. Channing Brown shares, I ask myself, where is your hope, Austin? The answer, it is but a shadow. It is working in the dark, not knowing if anything I do will ever make a difference. It is speaking anyway, writing anyway, loving anyway. It is enduring disappointment and then getting back to work. It is knowing this book may be read only by my mama and writing it anyway. It is pushing back, even though my words will never be big enough, powerful enough, weighty enough to change everything. It is knowing that God is God and I am not. Dear friends, let's remember that our hope is in Christ and in him alone, but we've got some work to do. I look forward to the journey with you. Amen.
called into unity with one another and the whole of creation, let us pray for our shared world. Merciful God, your power is revealed to us in common things, like yeast, whose main purpose is to join with other ordinary things to create something new and life-giving. Provoke us to be leaven for our communities, catalyzing diverse elements to unite in positive and life-giving ways. Lord, in your mercy. Creative God, your word yields light and understanding through simple things like tiny mustard seeds. Inspire us through appreciation of the seemingly insignificant to greater wisdom and faith about what is important in our lives. May we live as thankful and healing caretakers of your creation. Lord, in your mercy. Nurturing God, you ask us to love our neighbors. Make us yearn to come together with others who love justice and practice grace, to actively love and provide for the basic needs of all living things. Lord, in your mercy. Healing God, help us in our weakness and enable us to accept what we cannot change. Give us language when we do not know how to pray. Use us to confirm, to comfort the dying. Shelter the weary, relieve the oppressed, and care for the suffering. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we also ask that you lift up our prayers for Carol Klipstein battling cancer, Pat Wheeler battling cancer, Linda Katina and Gary Tooley, John Morin, also battling cancer, Jean Smith, recovering from surgery, and Natalie Haro. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we also ask that you are with those who mourn for all that have lost their lives due to COVID-19 and all those who mourn them. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for those celebrating birthdays this week. Craig Lundgren and Molly Kukas. We also give thanks for those celebrating anniversaries this week. Beth and Tony Tanky, and John and Jenny Fortuna. Lord, bless them as they have blessed us. Lord, in your mercy. Guiding God, in you we are never lost. Strengthen us to be constant witnesses of your grace to all people. Gather us one day with all your saints. Lord, in your mercy. In the knowledge that we cannot avoid your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Gathered by the Spirit into one body, let us pray as our Lord Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of the one who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, dear friends, live your lives in Christ, rooted and built up in him, and abounding in thanksgiving. And the blessing of the holy be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Go in peace, sharing Christ's light daily.